Hello out there, and welcome to Answers for Today. My name's Bill Wynn, and I'm here in Studio G with Pastor Terry Reynolds from Agape Chapel here in Southern California. And Terry, we're continuing along in our study here on the Holy Spirit. And uh, today's an exciting one because it, it, it poses some questions, but it also doesn't answer some questions. Um, is the Holy Spirit God? Mm is our question for today. And uh, with that, I'll hand it off to you, and then we'll come back to what the Scripture says. You know, um, a couple good friends of mine, um, of course, Dennis, who who the Lord's risen up to oversee uh, his channel, and my other friend, Jeff, that uh, oversees radio stations. Their whole purpose is, is that people would, first of all, come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and the second thing is that their life would be filled with, with the Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's really, uh, the past few weeks, Bill, we've been not only sharing testimonies about the Holy Spirit, we've been looking back in order to look forward. Now we wanted to get into the teaching part of it because a lot there's a lot of confusion about who the Holy Spirit is. And so, like you said, the question is today, and hopefully we'll look at the Scriptures to be able to see, is the Holy Spirit God? Paul was even had a question, or he had a comment about the Holy Spirit. Why don't you read that for everybody? Yeah, he in uh, 1 Timothy, and as you recall, uh, Timothy was an understudy of Paul's. He's a younger guy, and uh, Paul was teaching him the things about the ministry and uh, wanted Timothy to carry on when Paul was gone, of course. And uh, he, he defines this whole thing about the triune God as a mystery. And he says in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, he says, without question, this is the great mystery of our faith. That is the whole concept of a triune God being three in one. And that Christ was revealed in a human body and vindicated by the Spirit. He was seen by angels and announced to the nations he was believed, believed in throughout the world and taken to heaven in glory. So we have this understanding on the part of Paul as he's trying to teach Timothy that God is three different people, that he is God, the Father, that he is Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, and he is the Holy Spirit. Mm. And while many faiths understand God the Father, Jehovah, uh, and many understand Jesus, yes. the Son, there's, in many cases, uh, uh, confusion about the third member of the tri triune God being the Holy Spirit. So that's what we want to talk about today. And we must say, and why I started the program, by saying we're not going to answer all the questions. This is the great mystery of our faith. How can you be three things at once? You know, I think, too, is that what we see so often, how the enemy has a purpose and a goal, and not only does he attack the deity of Jesus Christ, who he is, he also tries to put the Holy Spirit on the back shelf someplace, because if the believers understand that the, that we're the temple of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is for their lives today, Bill, that then they will understand the importance of being empowered by the Holy Spirit because the enemy doesn't want them to be powered by the Holy Spirit, right? Because then they'll go out and be witnesses for Jesus Christ and how important it is. You know, I think it's interesting as we, the first thing that we would like to talk to them about is the triunity of God. The word Trinity is not found in the Bible, is it? No. And the word, uh, the triune of God isn't there. But throughout the Bible, we hear about it, Bill. What you do our math for us? It's like you said. <laughs> is it one plus one, or once you share with the people? Well, it's not one plus one plus one equals three. It's one plus one plus one equals one. Yes. So you, it's, you mean one times one? When, right. Yeah. And and so it's three and one. Yeah. Um, there's many analogies that I've heard that are examples that we can look at that are kind of the same. Uh, analogous sort of a phrase an egg yeah. is a shell the white and the yolk so there's three parts but we call it an egg yeah. 
And the same way, water. Water can be what? Either a liquid, a gas in the form of a cloud, or it can be a solid in the form of ice. Mm. So water can be three things at once. Um, obviously, it's temperature related, but you can have a situation where water is all three things. Um, we find that the Spirit, and to your point about reducing the Holy Spirit to being something less than an equal part of the Godhead, the three uh, individuals that make up the triune God, the Holy Spirit is equal to God the Father, and equal to Jesus. And when we look at Genesis, uh, in fact, in the first verse, the Bible starts to talk about the Holy Spirit because he says, the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Mm. So right there at the beginning of the Bible, and we know that throughout Genesis it talks about Jesus, so we have all three members of the Godhead right from the get-go talked about in the Bible. So it's not something that we want to put on the back shelf or that we want to relegate to a second level citizen. The Holy Spirit is right up there. What I'd like to do is put it up on your up on the screen for you to look at just what Bill was talking about in Genesis 1-1 we read in the beginning God is this is the Hebrew word translated God as Elohim which is the plural of El, which is God singular. It's interesting in the Hebrew language, there's a singular, there's a dual a dual sense, and there's a plural sense. God in the singular is El, dual is Allah, and then plural is Elohim. There's no denying the word El- Elohim suggests the triunity of God, just like you said, Bill, that they, it speaks about how the Spirit of God moved on the face of the, of the water. I just think it's so interesting. Talk about the, Bill, to them a little bit about the, the beginning of man. Isn't it interesting what it tells us there, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26? And again, it uses the word Elohim. Yes. And the verbs around there are plural. So it says, let us... If you looked at it in English, it says, let us make man in our own image. Mm. So God himself is stating that he is a multiple faceted or multiple part uh, individual. And right from the beginning, he says, after our likeness, he did not say, I will make man after my image. He says, I will make man after our image. So God is admitting and teaching right from the beginning that man is a three-part person, which we know from uh, all of our teaching through the Bible that man is body, spirit, and soul. You know, Bill, so what we are able to see, and we just touched on, and like you said, throughout the scriptures, you see the evidence of the triunity of God. But also we want to take a look at the attributes of the Holy Spirit now, that the scripture really does speak that he's God. And so we want to look at some scriptures, and if you have your notepad, you might want to write them down, or we'll try to put them up there where you could read. And the fact is, to establish the Holy Spirit as God, we will first show, Bill, that the attributes that only can be ascribed to God are ascribed to the Holy Spirit. And that's important, isn't it? Absolutely. And one of the ways that um, we can know that a person or an entity is God is by looking at what they can do. In other words, the same thing holds true with Jesus. When we look at his life, we look at the miracles and the things that Jesus did and the claims that he made where he made statements repeatedly that he was God and he fulfilled all those claims. That's why prophecy, for example, is so important in the understanding of what the Bible says is because claims are made and then they are either fulfilled or they're not. And if they're not, the Bible even says, don't believe someone 
and don't trust them if they make claims that don't come true. You know, so as we know that God is eternal, the Bible declares that, God the Father. We know Jesus is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, that he's eternal. And then in Hebrews 9, 14, just one of them, it speaks about the eternal spirit offered himself without spot. We're speaking about the Messiah. Throughout, we could find in the scriptures, throughout the scriptures, that the Holy Spirit is eternal. So we see. So what we're seeing is the attributes of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are the same, that they're eternal. Right, Bill? Yes. And when you, it, it's almost like a reverse engineering process. There are certain things that only God can do or that only in uh, attributes that only God possesses. And eternal life, eternity, beginning before the beginning, is one of those. Um, and so when you can prove that something is eternal or something makes a claim that they're eternal and then they prove it. For example, when Jesus proved that he overcame death, mm. he proved that death was not uh, going to have power over him. And he made that statement, which indeed implies that he ha he will live eternally, Yes, that he has an eternal attribute. You know, Bill, one of the other attributes that you see, and maybe you could help define it for us a little bit, this idea that God is omni, uh, omniscient. Why don't we start with there first, omniscient. Why don't you explain what that really means to be an, uh, omniscient? Well, omni, of course, is the Greek word for everything, and okay. omniscience is where we get our words for knowledge. Mm. And so all knowledge is what that means. And so um, we basically have uh, in Acts 15, he says, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Mm. So God is omniscient. He knows all things that are going to happen before they happen. It's like we've said many times, it's like there's a parade going on of the history of man and the world, and God is above the parade, and he can see the beginning, and he can see the end, yes. because he's outside of time, and he's above all things. And so as time goes on, he knows where the parade's going to end up, and it ends up in Revelation, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so God knows all those things. He knows how many hairs we each had on, the, on our head when we're born. He knit us in our mother's womb, and so he is omniscient. And this attribute of omniscience is also attributed to the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 2, 10, and 11. Let, let me read that, to, read every, that one. to everybody. And so what Bill is establishing, that God knows all things, but now listen to what Paul writes and it's First Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 10. He says, But God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For, w for what man knoweth the things of, of man, save the spirit of man which is in him. Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. And so what we see in here, Bill is the scriptures are telling us the things that are attributed to God are also attributed to the Holy Spirit. And certainly with, with knowledge, the, the, is it, first of all, we talked about the, the eternal attributes and then the all-knowing. And then what about the idea that the uh, omnipresence? Again, explain to what that is, and then we'll look at that a little bit. Well, what omnipresence means, it goes back to the word omni, which means everywhere or all, yes. and then present. So present everywhere. So when we say God is omnipresent, it means that he is can be anywhere at any time. He is at all places. So God is uh, available to us at any time and any place. And he is there with us no matter where we are, because, again, he is uh, omnipresent. 
You know, Bill, one thing that I love about the scriptures, how uh, even within the stories, they talk about how God is every place. You remember the story of King David, and I'm sure you do, and those listening, it's a fantastic story. David, towards the end of his life, and he was having such a great victory there in, in Jerusalem, and he wanted to build a, a temple for the Lord, a house for the Lord. And the Lord's response, he says, you know what? I, I can't be contained in, in, in your temple. As heaven, he says, I, I created the heavens. I filled the heavens. And really what he was saying to David, he says, I'm every place. And, and so if we understand that, that God is every place, so the question is, is the Spirit ever, is every place? Bill, why don't you read him Psalm 139, verse 7, what David also says. David says, whether shall I go from thy spirit? In other words, where should I go to, get, to find your spirit? Or whether shall I see from thy presence? So how can I be away from you? How can I find your spirit? And he basically is saying there's nowhere you can go where you won't be in the presence of God. And there's nowhere where you can go where you won't be in God's uh, spirit or with his spirit. So he's basically saying that both are equal and both are omnipresent and everywhere. And this is a good thing and a bad thing, okay, (laughs) because we think, oh, that's cool, God, I can have him anywhere. Well, that's the good news side of it. If you're still um, not in a relationship with the Lord, you might be doing things that God might not approve of. And he's very clear in his word about what things he approves of and what things he doesn't. And I think about certain parts of our country where there's things going on that God wouldn't approve of and that many... uh, Many people suffer as a result of that. And uh, the point is, is that you can't hide anything from God. And so he's omnipresent. So he sees you on your good times and he sees you when you're in your not so good times. So when you think about, oh, well, my sin is so rotten that I don't want to confess it to anybody, let alone God. Well, guess what? He already knows what your sin is and he was right there with you when you were doing it. So whatever it is, don't have any fears about that. And, um, you know, he he's seen it all. OK, yeah. I, I think about, uh, you know, as a pastor, you see it, pretty much everything and you hear about pretty much everything. And I'm sure, Terry, you've been a pastor a lot longer than I have. I mean, the bottom line is, is that it's all just sin. And it's all just evidence of how messed up as people we are without God. And so uh, don't let that hold you back from approaching God and getting reconciled with him through Jesus Christ. You know, it's so beautiful. So, so far we've seen that God is eternal. God, God is all-knowing. God, and he's every place. We also know also what the Bible te- teaches about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Sp- Holy Spirit, that God is omnipotent. That, you know, Bill, that he's all powerful. You and you look as we opened up and we opened up in Genesis. It says in the beginning, God and and really he just spoke the world into existence as we saw the the beautiful work of the, the triunity in creation. We see that God is all powerful in all things, and it, it really does. As you go through the scriptures, the all powerfulness is attributed to the Father, to the Son, and to the Spirit. Right? Absolutely. And what we see is is that um, you you have to think back. Okay, the Holy Spirit. Now we we've, we've established that he's he's everywhere. He knows everything, and he's all powerful. The same power as the Godhead who spoke the universe into existence. That's some power right there. Well, so we look at the scriptures and it says uh, in Luke, he says, the Holy Spirit shall come upon thee and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. So basically it's saying that if the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will have the power of God within you 
Yeah, you know, the beautiful story there is the birth of Jesus. Right. right. And, and earlier, and, and of course, this is a virgin, you know, have never known a man. And back in Genesis, I think it's Genesis eighteen fourteen. is there anything too hard for the Lord? <laughs> right. And Jesus said in Mark chapter 10, verse 27, he says, with God, all things are possible. possible. And also Luke says, he says, with God, nothing shall be impossible. And so the picture is, is as Mary was told that she's going to give a birth, birth to a child, and, here, and she's a virgin, and it says the Holy Spirit overshadowed her, and really the, 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 this idea of the highest shall overshadow thee, those words are actually the same words in the original language, they're synonymous, where the Holy Spirit was doing the work there. And so we see the powerful work of miracles that, we're, that are attributed so often. People think, well, God the Father did it, but it was actually the Holy Spirit was the one that was moving, doing the thing. And, and so with that Bill, I'd like us to talk a little bit about the, the works that we see of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Spirit. And, and as we said in Genesis, we read, uh, we read in Genesis chapter 1, 1, where it's in the beginning, the Elohim, as we created the heaven and the earth. And in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, we read, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God. And all things were made by him, without him was nothing that was made. And that was speaking about Jesus. And, and so we see the Spirit working in the creation, uh, not only of this world, but in the creation of, uh, of man. I love the fact that it, it's consistent throughout the Bible how the Holy Spirit is God, isn't it? Yeah, and these these miracles and these things that God has done, it was the three of them. And like it talks a little bit about how they, they sometimes will even have a conference among themselves to say, okay, let's make man like us in our own image. Yeah. And um, it's very interesting because we read the Bible and it says Jesus was made like man. Well, the, that's, if we interpret it that way, that isn't how it works. Really, man was made in the likeness of Jesus, right? And we attribute these, what they call them, anthropomorphic <laughs> attributes to God and to man. And there are things that we like to think of as attributes of man, but really it's the other way around. Mm. God came first, and the Holy Spirit was first, and so was Jesus. And as you, this passage as you read, Jesus was there from the beginning. So all three entities of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, were eternal and existed before anything was created. And they were there at the beginning act of creation. I find it's interesting, too, as we, we were talking about creation, but he's also the giver of life. Paul writes to us in 2 Corinthians 3.6, he says, The letter killeth, but the Spirit give life. And Jesus said in John 6.63, It is the Spirit that maketh alive. And so the life that we have, Bill, the life in the Spirit, the life in God, he, he, Paul writing the, the letter, that was the letter of the law, it kills. It doesn't bring you life. He says it's the Holy Spirit that actually that engages with us to give us the real life that we're all looking for. Right, right. And it, even the Bible itself was written through the inspiration of That's man right. by the Holy Spirit. And we refer to the Bible as the Word of God, mm. but in many ways it's the Word of the Holy Spirit given to man. Yes. Um, 2 Peter one twenty one says, For the prophecy came not in the old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And Second Timothy 3.16 says, uh, Paul says to Timothy, all scripture is given by inspiration of God through the Holy Spirit. You know, Bill, one of the, the beauty of the, of the work of the Spirit, the things that we study, the things that we see is the Holy Spirit is, 
Um, when you look at the Old Testament, and sometimes you, as you see in the New Testament, you see a commentary of the things that were spoken in the Old Testament. And, and I'd like us to, to look at it, a verse in Isaiah, and then we'll look at what Paul here uh, comments about it as we kind of wrap up our program. We have three or four pro, uh, minutes left. And Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8 where the prophet Isaiah said, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I, I send and who, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and tell this, uh, this people, he, uh, Hear ye indeed, but understand not. And you see indeed, but you perceive not. Then I find it's interesting. In Paul, in Acts chapter 28, verse 25, it says, and we spake, and we spake the Holy Spirit by Isaiah, or excuse me, well spake the Holy Spirit by Isaiah the prophet unto our father, saying, Hearing we shall hear and shall not understand, seeing you shall see and not perceive. Isaiah said the, the Lord spoke. Paul said it was the Holy Spirit that was speaking. It's almost like if you would take this into a court, you would want to argue it. It's right. almost like... Here I go, boom, deal one, right? The Holy Spirit is God, as, right. as, as you can see. Right, and the Holy Spirit is what led men to write the Bible. Mm. And so you have the Holy Spirit being used as a part of the Godhead to communicate with man and to give us a sense of conscience and to give us a sense of what God would want us to do in our life. So it's very important that we're in tune with the Holy Spirit because uh, by the way it's defined in the Bible, that means we're in tune with what God would want. So we opened up with a question, and I always like to come back to it and see if we answer the question. Bill, let me ask you, after you looked at the scriptures here this program, is the Holy Spirit God? Yes. And so with confidence, I believe, and we just touched on the scriptures, that you can look and you can examine God's word. Be like a Berean. Go search the scriptures for yourself to see if these things to be true. If the Holy Spirit is God, then I think it's important for you to look. It says, am I allowing the Holy Spirit to be part of my life? Am I listening to the words of Jesus? Am I looking at what Paul said that we should be filled with the spirit that we should be praying in the spirit we should be walking in the spirit it's so vitally important bill you got one minute left why don't you give the word of uh, people a word of encouragement as we head out well i can tell you that um living a life with the spirit as a part of it the holy spirit indwelling you is the most exciting thrilling adventure you can embark on and as Terry was just encouraging you, you know, the first step is to take Jesus into your heart and let him be the Lord of your life. The second step, now at that point in time, we have the Holy Spirit. But the second step is to ask the Holy Spirit to indwell you and to be a part of your life in a more powerful way, to give him the power. It's one thing to give somebody the reins uh, of your life, but now you're giving them the power and have them empower your life. Mm -hmm. On behalf of Bill and Terry, this is a, a great opportunity to be with you. We'll see you next week. For information about this broadcast, or if you have any questions, feel free to mail us at Agape Chapel OC, P.O. Box 4023, Huntington Beach, California, 92647. Or you can email us at AFT at agapechapeloc.org. Or visit our website at agapechapeloc.org. Until next time.